Friedrich Nietzsche was born in Leipzig in 1844. Throughout his youth, he had grown to be a disciple of Richard Wagner, who is a philosopher and artist. However, this appreciation had waned by 1872. Nietzsche had grown increasingly dissatisfied with Wagner's embrace of Christian morality, uh, German nationalism, and anti-Semitism. He criticized Wagner for focusing too much on Apollonian decadence, which he identifies as this uh, pessimistic rationalism that rejects the Dionysian beauty and emotionality of life. Nietzsche thought that art should reflect uh, the delicate balance of the Dionysian and the Apollonian. Uh, and avoid becoming too dialectical or high-minded. In 1879, Nietzsche started developing serious health problems, he began uh, collecting a pension and living solitarily, which enabled him to uh, begin work on some of his more high-impact philosophical publications. Much of his writing focused on the uh, rejection of the idea that there was some kind of concrete absolute morality. He had strong distaste for institutions that attempted to set their own moral standards. This arguably culminated in the 1889 publication of Twilight of the Idols, uh, which can kind of be viewed as a summation of much of his previous philosophy, and it would be his second to last publication before he uh, lapsed into a severe dementia uh, for the remainder of his life, which ended in 1900. Following his death, his sister would gain control of his estate and edit much of his work uh, to make it appear in favor of fascism, anti-Semitism, and generally a lot of stuff that Nietzsche was uh, vehemently opposed to. These inconsistencies were gradually revealed, and beginning around the 1960s, perception of his philosophy became more generally accepted by mainstream audiences. He would go on to be massively influential in post-structuralist philosophy of the 20th century, as well as anarchist philosophy of the 20th century. Twilight of the Idols begins with a section of short-form entries titled Maxims and Arrows. Uh, each entry consists of either advice or a description regarding the nature of life. Uh, the tone is intentionally contradictory and humorous, highlighting Nietzsche's firm belief in the balance of emotion and rationality. Uh, he argues that happiness stems from an appreciation of why life exists, that there's little to be gained from attempts to explain how one can achieve satisfaction. Uh, rather, one should possess the strength to forge on as a leader of your own faith. Uh, he closes by saying, The formula for my happiness? A yes, a no, a straight line, a goal. This can be seen as an opposition to the Socratic position that true knowledge leads to acknowledgement of knowing nothing. The next chapter is titled The Problem of Socrates, and it Nietzsche begins by noting how the wisest throughout history have always settled on life kind of having no meaning because they are caught up in the act of demanding proof of things. He views Socrates and Plato as beginning a path towards societal decay by pushing rationalism on philosophy. This attempt to explain life is a waste of time as he says uh, the value of life cannot be estimated. He criticizes Socrates for his uh, unrestrained application of logic and tendency to deconstruct out of what Nietzsche views as ill will towards others. Friedrich criticizes Socrates for believing that reason, virtue, and happiness share the same root. He views Socratic dialectics as fairly ineffective, arguing that it mostly just makes people angry uh, and that they will easily dismiss your argument purely out of emotion. Uh, therefore, dialectics are useless without the enforcement of one's rights, essentially meaning that empowerment is more useful than debate. Uh, because those who employ dialectics are usually being subjected to the repression of ideas, uh, this cannot be considered a form of free thinking. Uh, there is no freedom of one is subjected to repression. Nietzsche thinks the growth and popularity of dialectics reflects the historical point at which people became subjected to tyranny uh, and lost mastery of themselves. Adopting rationality resulted in the abandonment of instinctuality, which Nietzsche views as the true root of happiness. In the next chapter, Reason and Philosophy, Nietzsche criticizes philosophers for attempting to explain life, which eludes reduction and explanation. He mocks the philosophical debate over sensory perception and reality, pointing out that what the senses dictate is entirely dependent upon our interpretation of that perception. Reason, Nietzsche argues, is the falsification of the senses' raw signals. He also criticizes philosophy for putting the first last, uh, which basically means uh, attributing the source of meaning to some unified theory or source, i.e. like using God to explain morality. He follows this with four propositions that summarize the points of the chapter, largely that attempts to uh, distinguish between the real and the apparently real have led to the decay of the Dionysian and Apollonian balance. In Morality is Anti-Nature, Nietzsche begins by attacking the church for teaching people to resist their passions, uh, such as sexual urges or pride. He argues resisting these passions uh, resists the essence of life itself. Anybody who preaches this restrictive ideology does so out of disgust or shame for their own passions. The only good morality is one that encourages the natural course of things. The natural course of things, Nietzsche says, must account for the great diversity of people and passions on earth. 
in the four great errors, Nietzsche identifies the first as mistaking cause for consequence, as in assuming that an outcome is due to an action of an individual instead of recognizing that the action of the individual might have been predetermined by their conditions. Essentially, Nietzsche is questioning human agency here. He identifies the second as immoral unreason, which is the precept that happiness stems from prescribing specific behaviors. Uh, third is the error of false causality, which Nietzsche identifies as the tendency for people to project their own biases into the natural world uh, and mistake them as the reason for why something occurred. Fourth is the error of free will, which Nietzsche says was invented to ascribe guilt and punishment, but does not reflect how little agency individuals may have. In The Improvers of Mankind, Nietzsche dismisses philosophy that attempts to establish moral facts. He argues that Christian philosophy is the effect of taming human beings, which is the opposite of improving mankind as it limits behavior. He discusses how the Indian caste system makes it a moral imperative to to deprive untouchables of basic necessities for survival, thus making them sick. This is necessary because they do not fit into a category that can make them eligible for moral improvement. Nietzsche claims that Christianity began as a revolt of an untouchable class against Judaism, uh, which was a morally distinct group with its own identity, but ironically Christianity then became a faith system that bore all of the faults it may have originally ascribed to Judaism. So this is the point where the book starts to get um, very, very weird. Um, I'm tempted to kind of just run through the next few sections somewhat rapidly, strictly because of the like, um, the thrust of the text kind of runs off the rails here. And you know, what Germans lack, uh, Nietzsche laments the formation of the German state as the end of German philosophy. Uh, he criticizes Germans for loving Christianity, alcohol, and bad music. Uh, generally, he's just not a fan of the German state, and there's all sorts of complaints that he has about it. The next section is even more bonkers. In the Wikipedia summary of this book, they left the section under Expeditions of an Untimely Man completely blank. Like, there's just nothing there. Uh, and it's literally the largest section of it. Basically, it's just an 1800-style burn book of philosophers and artists and people that Nietzsche doesn't like very much. Uh, this tends to be because he views their philosophy as taking a weak position or um, being subservient to Christian morality. He talks about how art has to be made by individuals who are intoxicated, meaning that um, they need to be filled to the point of um, bursting with uh, some sort of emotion. This could be like sexual desire or narcotic intoxication. Um, but the point being that they have to sort of input their excess energy that they have into an object in order to imbue it with aesthetic, right? He also isn't a big fan of Darwin. Uh, he argues that the struggle for survival is less important than the struggle for power. He dismisses Malthus, and he talks about how the tendency in history is actually for the weak to overpower the strong. Uh, this, he believes, happens because the weak are cleverer than the strong. He talks about how much he's a fan of hypocrisy and how it's a sign of strong belief and laments that it's discouraged in the age of virtue. Something that also gets talked about in this section of the book is how uh, Nietzsche argued that uh, nothing is inherently beautiful, that the beauty is the result of man sort of projecting his own identity onto objects or other individuals, right? It's kind of like an, an objectification of objects or individuals based upon the satisfaction that an individual gets out of it, right? Another group Nietzsche criticizes in this section is uh, leftists, that they complain too much in his mind. But toward the end, he talks about how much he's a big fan of Dostoevsky and not a big fan of Herbert Spencer. Maybe most importantly, he talks about how uh, criminality is created by uh, having individuals be made sick in the same way that he discusses um, the Indian caste system working, right? It's because of pe people are being deprived of what they need that individuals are led toward criminality. So, I mean, what's the take home here? Nietzsche's kind of all over the place, right? His philosophy basically um, like exploded human thought. We've seen a lot of rationalists thus far who spent a lot of time asking the question of wherein lies truth and Nietzsche comes along and says uh, there is no inherent truth there are no inherent morals everything is relative to power structures in place and what they dictate uh, he also says that revolutions come through people being given the freedom to think differently Nietzsche goes on to be pretty important to the evolution of anarchist theory and post-structuralist theory in the 20th century these schools were much more focused upon uh, the role of individuals in society as opposed to the role of the collective. Anarchism kind of moved away from discussing uh, how groups are oppressed and more toward how individuals are oppressed, and this is the main concern of Nietzsche, right? Uh, I'm not going to go out and say that I agree with everything in this text or that you should agree with everything in this text. I think that like Nietzsche himself would probably tell you that it's important to both find agreement and disagreement with this text because contradiction is, is good and it's, it's a sign that one has convictions. Like I find myself chuckling at times due to how like 
absurd uh, he can be in his language, but I recommend trying it out before you move on to maybe uh, critical theory of the 20th century or post-structuralist philosophy, um, because his fingerprints are just kind of all over that stuff. Um, and if you do try it out, I hope you enjoy it, and happy reading.